Hello and welcome to your Hobby Connection. Thank you for joining us. Today we're going to be starting a video series on the Lionel Catalog for 2024. Now I know a lot of you are going to say, it's been done before, it's boring, why would you ever want me to watch a video talking about trains that one, I can't afford, or two, that I can just go look at the catalog for. Well, this video series is going to be informing you of some of the history behind the locomotives, what kind of a part and role they play, their success, some nuances that I found on the internet, things of that nature, because I want to draw it in to where you and I understand more about the history and then the portrayal that Lionel has been able to provide us, to bring that lost, forgotten history into a more tangible reality for us to operate. So join me now as we check out the Vision Line Triplex from Lionel. So, what is a triplex, you ask? Well, a triplex has two pilot wheels, eight drivers, eight more drivers, eight more drivers, and two trailing wheels for the Erie class locomotive. You have a two eight 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 two locomotive. What is the Erie Triplex? Well, it was a machine that was classified as a P1, it was the class. It was built by Baldwin Locomotive Works and was delivered to Erie Railroad in 1914. Now, the guy who designed and patented the locomotive for Baldwin was known as George R. Henderson. Why did they come up with the triplex, and what purpose did it serve? Well, in 1904, there was a gentleman named Mallet, and he created the Mallet system, where you had a high pressure at one end and a low pressure on the other end. So, for this example, the cylinders on the middle driver set were the high pressure, and the ones on the outer ends, the front and the rear, were low pressure cylinders. What does that mean? So if the boiler had 225 psi of pressure, 225 psi would go into the center cylinders, and the exhaust pressure would go to the front and rear cylinders. Now, fun fact, the way that the triplexes were designed was on one side, the cylinders would exhaust to the front, and on the opposite side, the cylinders would exhaust to the back cylinders. So there's a bit of a problem here, if you ask me, because you've only got the pressure and volume of one set of cylinders feeding two cylinders. That's, that's a pretty big discrepancy. So was this locomotive successful? Well, history seems to have mixed results on that. Because when Baldwin designed this locomotive, in theory, it should be able to pull around 640 cars. Unfortunately, Erie only managed to do a test of 250 loaded rail cars up a grade. And it stopped 17 miles later when one of the cars broke. They don't say whether it broke the car in half or if it broke a coupler. But whatever the issue was, it ended up breaking the train to the point where they had to stop the test. And that's when Erie said, no, we're relegating this to a pusher helper locomotive. No longer was it designed as a mainline road engine. And even then, under helper service, it had its issues. Uh, as drag freight, you don't need high speeds. But they wanted it at 10 miles or more per hour of operation. And they were struggling with it at that speed because the locomotive's firebox and great heating area was too small and the boiler not big enough to hold enough steam in order to feed the hungry cylinders and the hungry locomotive. So what wound up happening was you would run out of steam around 10 miles an hour. And in some cases, other railroads had even less success and would run out of steam at around 5 miles an hour. So, that being said, it had a tractive effort built for the Erie Railroad of around 176,256 pounds of tractive effort. Now, for those of you guys who are big boy fanatics, just like me, you're going to go, 
But, 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 the big boy has 136,000 pounds of tractive effort. And you're right. The big boy has less tractive effort, but it's more successful than the triplex. Why is that? Because Union Pacific took major risks. They did things that even the builder said can't be done. They said, build it anyways. But you also have to realize, this is before the Berkshires. This is before the Challengers. This is way, way before. I mean, we're talking 1916 was when the first locomotives, or when the finishing locomotives were being delivered. And the first locomotive was taken, taken in in 1914. So we're 15, 20 years before they had the technological advantages that the Challengers and the Big Boy classes had. So yeah, there was a lot of learning curves, and this is one of the better locomotives of that era. It had a 11,600 gallon water tank on the uh, Erie locomotive with uh, 16 tons for fuel. Uh, the had, uh, locomotives were delivered in numbers 2603 to 2605, and the very first locomotive, number 2603, was known as Matt H. Shea. And that was seen in this photo right here of the Matt H. Shea locomotive. So when they were delivered to Erie, they were numbered 2603, 2604, 2606. Uh, five, I'm sorry. Now, later on, they became uh, the 5000 series. 5014, 5015, and 5016. Now, as you'll notice, they were big brooding locomotives and they had different uh, pistons and designs and they went through several iterations under the Erie's control until they finally gave up. As a matter of fact, in 1929, they scrapped every last one of the locomotives for the Erie Railroad, which honestly was a shame, but it makes sense when you look back at what was going on with the system. They just they couldn't keep up with the demand of the railroad. The railroad needed faster freight. Heavier cars needed to get moved faster. So they just couldn't keep up with it. So we're going to move on to the Lionel Legacy features that we get to see. This will be actually able to simulate the wheel slips that would happen under the tender, which was another major issue for the Erie locomotives, or the triplexes in general was because you had a whole driver set under a tender which had water and fuel being depleted on it, you would have slippage. Sometimes at starts, sometimes during the middle of a push or a pull. And that's a huge hindrance because you don't want to be having a locomotive break free because when they break free of their traction, not only do they use up a lot of steam, but they have a really high potential for damaging their wheels and the pistons and the drivers. So it was a huge issue. So this locomotive will be able to actually simulate that on command. It has multi-speaker sound. It has a smoke and tender steam. It has the whistle steam effect. It has a swinging bell. It has the legacy rail sounds, a electro coupler, which means you can use your remote to open that coupler to separate a train. It has number specific detailing and it has a dummy scale coupler and a dummy reel coupler if you want to double head your trains. It has the legacy speed control equipment. It has Bluetooth so you can run it with your smartphone or with the legacy cab 3 controller and uh, app. It has the Lionel voice control if you want to talk to your locomotive which sounds fun to me. You've also got an IR transmitter that talks between the sensor track. It's got maintenance-free motors. It's got directional lighting, including the operational headlight and backup lights on the rear of the tender. It has bicolor illumination classification lights. It's got traction tires, an interior cab that's illuminated. It's a die-cast body with pilots and trucks. It has a die-cast metal tender body and trucks. So we're not talking a light locomotive here. We're talking pretty heavy, pretty well done. It's got a Dyna chuff, a real-time cooling whistle, five different whistles and five different bells to use. It's got uh, sequence controls. It is 27 and a quarter inches long 
It has a minimum curvature of 072. It has six official rail speeds with crew talk. So we're going to go through and watch the videos of the cool things that we get to see. So it has the separate boiler and tender chest. So let's check the video out. That was pretty cool seeing that. Let's check out the wheel details. The running gear looks amazing if you ask me. Got the firebox flicker. Okay. Let's check out the swinging bell. That's a pretty cool feature, honestly. Okay, the whistle steam effect. All right. The firebox flicker. We've already seen that a little bit. You can kind of see he's got that detailed uh, engineer and fireman in there. All right. Crew talk, which for me, it's okay. It, it's more the radio era, not the era of the time, which would have been uh, papers and uh, handoffs. Okay, I'm going to save the wheel slip for last because that's going to be the coolest part of the video. Okay, then here's the rear steam exhaust on the tender. And then remember how they said uh, bi colored lights? Here you go. That's cool. Okay, and then the auto firing coupler if you want to fire it. So, with the press of a button, you can cut your train and move on. And now the piece de resistance. The thing that made the triplexes infamous or famous. All right, so as you can see, Lionel spared no expense. They went all out on this locomotive. It has a lot of features. Probably the one feature that I would love to have seen, but probably could not have been fit into this particular model, would have been the depleting coal load. But given that they put a motor in the tender to help simulate the wheel slip instead of just the sound effects, which has been a norm for many, many years, you would have the wheel slip sound effects, but you wouldn't actually be able to see it. So I actually applaud Lionel for making that decision of taking that wheel slip feature and making it an actual visual reality instead of just a sound effect. So, we're going to take a look at some of these locomotives here. So, they are $2,500. I know it says $2,499.99. Add the penny, it, it's $2,500 MSRP. Can you find it at a better price at like Brady's Trains, Legacy Station, and other places? You most definitely have an opportunity to get a better price. It depends on the volume and their ability to order these locomotives. Now, as you've noticed in some of the photos that I've shown you, there are different types of locomotive features. Like this one right here, 
as we'll see in this video, uh, in this photo here, it does have the same setup for the 2670, 2603. So it has the one saddle tank there. And if you look further on, I do believe it is this, nope, wrong photo. There it is. It's this photo right here where we see it's got the two saddle tanks on the front. So that being said, we do have a variety of locomotive designs that help set the engine apart to show the different eras of the railroad. Now, it does have the iron blue for the uh, Russian iron coating. So that's why you get the blue look there. You've got the standard matte black look here. And, believe it or not, the Denver and Rio Grande Western Railroad actually did consider buying a triplex locomotive. There's plans, there's even a contract on the on the website that I've found, which I can link for you guys, talking about how there's documentation found that they were thinking about actually ordering a locomotive. So the DNRGW did think about a triplex, but they shied away from the triplex locomotive when they found out Erie was having so many issues with the speed and the pressure. So, unfortunately for us, we'll never get to see a triplex locomotive from Denver and Rio Grande Western. Although, it would have been quite fascinating to see it operating on their railroad. So that's one of the things that I found during my research on the triplexes pretty unique. Because I thought, there's no way DNRGW ever had one. And they didn't. But there was actually talk to get one. Now, we're moving on. So, the Northern Pacific never had one. So, unfortunately, no, it didn't happen, which is sad. Now, there is one glaring issue with the number 701 that they're showing for the Virginian. The Virginian only made one locomotive. It was the number 700, and that was the XA for Experimental Class Locomotive 1. They ordered their locomotive in late 1916 when it was delivered. It was a 28884. So, in other words, as you'll see in this photo here, it had four wheels on the back side as opposed to the two wheels on the back side of the Erie locomotives. And that's kind of a shame that, that Lionel missed a golden opportunity, in my opinion of being able to have the 700 locomotive with a 28884. I do understand their reasoning behind it, and that's because when you're trying to do a mass production, having one or two or three different locomotives requires a whole different tooling, requires a whole different molding, a whole different line of stuff, and it becomes expensive and a pain in the neck. So I understand it, I just feel like it was kind of a darn, yep. You could have done this and it would have been really cool, but I understand the reasons behind it. The glow-in-the-dark finish on the Halloween locomotive looks pretty cool, if you ask me. Um, would I buy it? Probably not, just because I I don't have a need for it. I'm, I'm not a really big Halloween guy, unfortunately. Now, you'll notice that they have a Lionel line, so for those of you guys who have Lionelville, this would be a great locomotive for your Lionelville train line. They've also got a the hybrid version, which is the unnumbered, unpainted locomotive. So if you want to do your own custom painting, your own custom railroad, you are more than welcome to buy said locomotive, paint it, letter, and make it your own. So if you want to make it the Virginia number 700, you can do that. If you want to make it a uh, a CSX locomotive? You can do that too. Now, one of the cool things that Lionel started doing, especially I believe it was last year, they started doing their Vision Line Super Sets. So, what does this include for this, this year's Super Set? Well, other than the price tag of about $4,000, it includes the locomotive itself, which will be the number 5016 in the Russian iron boiler color with the trim and it will be as delivered to Erie. It also comes with 15 freight cars. 
and it has a scale of over 15 feet in length. That is a big train for a big locomotive. So you have four Woodside Reefers right here. Let me show you what they look like a little closer here. You've got the Berkshire Ham and Bacon Company. You've got the Coca, Co uh, Coca Company for the Our Mothers. You've got a beer company car. These are reefers, which means refrigerated cars. And you've also got a uh, refrigerator transit union car. You've got a hobo box car and a steel sided box car. You've got a wooden vision car. Well, looks wooden to me. It's a stock car. What that means, vision car, is it comes with legacy control. It will have sound effects. So, you want to have quilling pigs? You've got it. You want to have the sounds of them loading, unloading, or when they're getting banged around? It comes with that too. It also has an operating coupler on one end of the car and a regular operating coupler on the other end. So, if you need to set that car out to go uh, deliver it when you're on your runs, you can do that. It also comes with two box cars here that are sheathed or double sheathed. You have three hoppers and you have a Vision Woodside Caboose. What does that Vision Caboose come with? Well, it is illuminated. It has a cupola with a figure in it. It has electrocoupler on the front end. It is an IR track equipped car. It has rail sound, so it plays sounds when in motion, user-activated dialogue, and it has an air whistle. So you want to be able to have uh, the train running in reverse and you got to blow for the crossing? Use the caboose's air whistle. So overall, this is a very impressive train set. I like it. As a matter of fact, I, I think I'm going to end up trying to get one. What I don't know is if I can be able to afford it, but I'm going to try. So if you guys want to help me out with that, all I require, well not require, all I request is that you like, subscribe, share the video, because once I get a thousand subscribers and I get 4,000 hours of watch time, the videos will be monetized and I'll be able to get a few bucks here and there for all the times you guys watch my videos and go through the ads. And believe me, YouTube ads are really annoying, I understand, but that's all I need, that's all I want. If you want to do more, you're more than welcome to reach out to me, but I just need a little bit of time and energy to be able to do this. And money helps ease those problems. Because, let's face it, how many of us have $4,000 just lying around that you can't use for anything other than trains? I wish I had that problem, but I don't. Yet. But, what I talked about earlier, there's the triplex, but in my research, I found that there was a quadplex. Yes, could you imagine a 288882? That was actually almost a reality. Baldwin had on drawings and in a patent a 288882. So we're talking four sets of eight drivers. That would have been a cool locomotive to have replicated. A what-if locomotive. So I I would love to see if Lionel could do that. Making a, a locomotive that is hypothetical in experimentation only. But if they do, great. If they don't, well... It's a thought. If they get bored of constantly doing the same locomotives over and over and over again, that experimental locomotive seems like it'd be pretty cool to have. So if you guys liked the video, please subscribe, share it with your friends and family, and uh, I'll see you guys next time around.